I'm Dr. Clayton Lane. The topic for this video will be rotator cuff impingement and tears. I'd like to get into a little bit more detail about impingement, its causes, and how it works. We'll talk about uh, several reasons uh, that a person can get impingement. Here we see the most simple version of that. To the left you see the rotator cuff muscles again enveloping the ball of the shoulder. Above that you see the acromion, the coracoacromial ligament. And you see this nice space uh, represented by the green paint here uh, over the rotator cuff and between the ball of the shoulder and the acromion and the coracoacromial ligament, uh, the arch of the shoulder. Now, Remember, the rotator cuff doesn't actually lift the shoulder, but it is what allows us to lift our shoulder. And by that, I mean the deltoid muscle, bigger muscle uh, on the outside of the shoulder, provides a force to lift the humerus. And what the rotator cuff does is compresses the ball of the shoulder into the cup and counteracts these forces so that when we lift our arm, the ball of the shoulder stays centered in that cup. Now, impingement is what happens when that doesn't work properly. The deltoid lifts the uh, humerus up, and here you see the rotator cuff muscle, for whatever reason, is not able to counteract that force. The ball of the shoulder shifts up, pinching the rotator cuff, also the bursa, against the bone of the acromion, causing pain or impingement. Now what can happen over time is the ball of the shoulder bumps up against the coracoacromial ligament you saw here. The body reacts to that by building some bone, and you see this uh, bone spur, which is represented by the blue triangle here, beginning to form, and we hear a lot about bone spurs in the shoulder. Now, impingement is not just a bone spur, however. It's very tempting for us to look at a sharp piece of bone in the shoulder, represented by this blue triangle, and intuitively explain to ourselves that, oh, well, that must be what's cutting into the rotator cuff and tearing the cuff, but that's not necessarily true. Here you see that sharp spike of bone on x-ray. Your doctor may have pointed it out to you before. What you can't see on that x-ray is the ligament that goes to the coracoid here, the coracoacromial ligament, and that spike of bone is buried within that ligament. Now, it does reduce the elasticity of the ligament at this point, so if the ball of the shoulder hits there, then, of course, you're going to get a uh, a little bit more trauma than you normally would, but it's not a sharp spike of bone that you may uh, envision. Now again, I alluded to the fact that impingement is not simple. Uh, just because one person has impingement doesn't mean it's the same as another and the treatments are not the same either. Here we see a few examples of what can cause impingement. The first one is the one we uh, alluded to excuse me, uh, discussed previously the cuff fatigue. If the rotator cuff fatigues and the deltoid pulls the humerus up, then the ball of the shoulder rides into the acromion causing impingement. But then there's multiple other reasons. Cuff tears can cause that, scapula dysfunction, ligamentous uh, tightness in certain regions of the shoulder can cause it, even core weakness in the body and the abdomen and the back can cause it poor throwing mechanics, abnormal anatomy from fracture or a birth abnormality, and so on and so forth. So you see it, the etiology of impingement is very complex um, while we try to it sometimes oversimplify it. So let's start with the shoulder blade. We talked about how dysfunction of the shoulder blade can lead to impingement. Well here you see in this video the scapula contributes up to one-third of the motion of the shoulder and it's analogous some would say to a seal balancing the ball on its nose as the shoulder moves the scapula has to be able to coordinate its muscle contractions in order to move and balance the ball of the shoulder in different positions as well as just get out of the way here at the chromium so that the ball doesn't uh, impinge on it and that's exactly what happens when dysfunction occurs you see here the chromium which is attached to that scapula if that bone doesn't get out of the way as we lift the shoulder then you get impingement of the bursa represented by this oval here or the cuff or bone. You can also have impingement from core weakness. Here you see an athlete with good core strength. The shoulders are level as they go into a forward lunge. The uh, ankle, knee, hip, and right shoulder are in good alignment. This is an example of good mechanics and good core strength. Well, what happens if the core gets weak? 
the abductor muscles of the hip are weak, the hip begins to internally rotate, you see the knee coming across the midline here, that causes the athlete to drop the shoulder. Well, if this is a throwing athlete, you can obviously see that that scapula and the acromion we just mentioned isn't going to get out of the way as effectively and you're going to get an impingement from that. So when I see somebody with shoulder pain, I can't just focus in on just this area. I have to look at the whole kinetic chain, it's called, uh, which involves the balance from the top of the head to the ankle. Talked about ligamentous tightness causing uh, impingement. That can also uh, be referred to as stiffness of the shoulder. If you look here, the ball of the shoulder uh, and the glenoid or cup of the shoulder represented in this diagram. Here you can see a simple version of the ligaments and they are fairly simple. They're mostly in the front and the back of the shoulder. This is uh, looking down on the shoulder. These posterior ligaments can become contracted and when they do what happens is that effectively causes the shoulder instead of rotating as the humerus lifts up it can hinge off of those posterior ligaments causing the ball of the shoulder to ride up and again bump the acromion or other sites in the shoulder such as the rotator cuff, the labrum you can see here is getting crunched sometimes the bone uh, on bone contact again occurs and that's referred to as internal impingement. We talked about rotator cuff weakness again I'll take you through that one more time because this is one of the most common causes um, and it also demonstrates that simply by strengthening the rotator cuff muscles you can avoid a lot of the problems of impingement and that's why it's one of the most common things that we prescribe in physical therapy. Here again you see that green space, the happy uh, space between the ball of the shoulder, the acromion, and the coracoacromial ligament. As these cuff muscles weaken, the deltoid is able to pull the ball of the shoulder up. That space is gone now, obliterated. The only thing left is the bursa and the cuff, and they're rubbing against the acromion and the coracoacromial ligament, leading to bursitis and tendonitis, and ultimately increasing weakness of this cuff. So then what happens if you weaken that cuff? You get further impingement. And so then the cycle or the cuff pathology continuum, as I talked about in the first video, goes on and on. Now, if this does develop into a tear, it's important to realize that not all tears are created equal. Uh, often people compare themselves to their friends who have cuff tears, and this is a, a mistake because obviously there's different types of tissue in the shoulder. If you have a very healthy professional athlete such as this, uh, has very strong ligaments, very strong tendons, very strong muscles, bone, etc., <clears throat> If that athlete tears his cuff, it's going to be a very different situation than an elderly person who over 20 years has slowly worn through the cuff and that cuff tissue has uh, changed in chemical nature and is a weaker, poorer tissue. The treatment for this kind of tear is going to be very different than the treatment in the athlete you see here to the right. It's worthwhile to mention a little bit the progression of the tear. The reason that's important is because that's really what's guiding our treatment. Because if we can predict the future, then we know what to do now as far as treating uh, the rotator cuff tear. What happens when we get a partial tear is multifactorial. But you can see here from this diagram, the blood supply that represented by these red lines here, when you get a partial tear of the cuff, those blood vessels get kinked, and so you have decreased nutrition going into this area of the cuff. In addition to that, the synovial fluid or joint fluid, now the cuff is exposed to that uh, fluid. This fluid comes in to the tear site. And the problem with that is that synovial fluid has uh, inhibitory factors in it that prevent healing. This is one of the reasons, as you'll see in the knee talk, that the ACL never heals. The synovial fluid doesn't allow it to heal. It cuts off the circulation, uh, essentially. And then finally there's the notch phenomena. This is more intuitive. If you have a, t a full thickness tear in the cuff, you can see that this muscle, the forces that it uh, exerts, are going to be focused on the edge of the rotator cuff now. Not here, but on this, these fibers, and that can cause the tear to unzip and get bigger and bigger. And then ultimately, as that progresses further and further, you start to get atrophy of the cuff muscle, altered mechanics, which uh, 
increase the pathologic forces in the shoulder, causing the ball of the shoulder to more chronically ride up into this area, rubbing against the acromion and the coracoacromial ligament, wearing through not only the cuff, but also starting to wear through the biceps tendon here, who uh, often people don't realize actually goes through the shoulder. That biceps tendon begins to get inflamed and even torn. And then ultimately what happens is the ball of the shoulder buttonholes through the cuff muscles. So this large tear in the cuff up here uh, is able to slide around the ball of the shoulder and then it's really stuck in a superior position and that's an end stage disease. So in summary, impingement in itself is a simple concept but what causes it may be more complex and harder to determine. Not all cuff tears are the same and therefore the treatments should be tailored to the tear in the individual.